we can go to nevadafloods.org. <laughs> nevadafloods.org has uh, the content that you're going to be seeing today, and it also has other uh, relevant information for this. Uh, Aaron Warnock, good morning, and the floor is yours. All right. Thank you, Hunter. And I would just like to add, uh, at this time, nevadafloods.org has a portion of the presentations today. But by the end of the webinar, once this has passed, we should have everything up for your reference to go back to. Or uh, if you know somebody that has missed the training today and would like to take a look at those, they will be available on nevadafloods.org. So I'm Erin Warnock. I am the Nevada State Floodplain Manager and NFIP coordinator, that is the National Flood Insurance Program coordinator. And I am also the Nevada State Lead for Silver Jackets. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about a silver jacket. It looks like I do not have the presenter ability to advance the slide. So whomever does, can we please uh, move to the next slide? That, that's me, Erin, I can advance your slides. Thank you, Patricia. So Silver Jackets is um, an interagency partnership between um, the U.S. Army Corps and uh, state lead teams. So like I said, I'm the lead for Nevada and we'll work together on projects to reduce flood risk and we submit proposals for projects every year. They are competitive proposals and then they go up to headquarters and headquarters sifts out which um, projects will exist that year. Usually there's anywhere between um, about two to four projects a year. And this is a continuation of a project that we started last year. Some of you might have attended our emergency action plan outreach for Nevada virtually was held in August. And this is a continuation of that original project. Next slide, please. So overall, the project goal for Silver Jackets is to reduce flood risk. And we do this through um, seeking out communities or um, situations that are in need of help mitigating flood risk. And we work with them to, whether that is to update a website to provide more information for outreach, to help somebody build an emergency action plan, to build a floodplain management plan, um, and we rely on our team that we meet with. So we bring together people just around the state that have a stake in, um, in flood and in flood mitigation, and we get input from them on what, what's gonna be needed for these projects to formulate them. And that is how we come up with these projects such as this to help reduce the flood risk in Nevada. Next slide, please. And this is just a really great diagram, kind of what we stick to, the mindset of the flood risk management cycle. It all really begins with mitigation. So mitigating our flood risk, and that involves preparation and training. So providing it to these communities, to these leaders in those communities, and then preparing them for response when a flood does occur, because it will. And um, then of course, assisting in recovery. Next slide, please. All right, and Patricia is gonna take it from here. Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Patricia Fontanet, and I am a water resources planner with the Army Corps of Engineers. Um, we've worked a lot with Nevada Division of Water Resources in the past and a lot of Silver Jackets projects, I'm happy to be talking with you all today. So as Erin was mentioning, um, we work a lot in Silver Jackets projects. This webinar is possible because of the Silver Jackets program. And this graphic um, helps explain how Silver Jackets can be used to build partnerships. So this project, based on, this graphic, sorry, highlights the importance of partnerships and it shows the process on how this can happen. So many times, communities, agencies, we find ourselves on the left side of this of the collaboration continuum, simply coexisting with each other and remaining self-reliant. But through time, 
we can increase our ability to collaborate by sharing resources, sharing information, cooperating and coordinating on projects. And eventually we can build and strengthen partnerships to establish that sense of responsibility. And this can happen by undergoing a series of projects. So the collaboration and the partnerships build and strengthen as the projects go on. And this relationship building, this partnership building is something that Silver Jackets is very effective in doing. It's something that we are doing right now. Um, we're hoping to build and strengthen partnerships. So today, for example, is a really good opportunity for us to get to know each other, get to know new people, and start building those relationships, start creating those partnerships. But it can also be a good opportunity to strengthen existing partnerships that may already be in development. So as this webinar goes on, I encourage you all to take advantage of this, ask questions, seek out other contacts, make connections, and talk about resources that may be beneficial to you or that may be beneficial to others. And just to give more examples of how this can work, I'm going to talk about a few other projects that we have done through Silver Jackets. So something that's really relevant to this audience is the Emergency Action Plan Guidebook. So the Silver Jackets team created a step-by-step -step instruction process on how to develop an emergency action plan, an EAP. It is mostly targeted and focused for smaller and more medium-sized communities, um, but this is the kind of support that Silver Jackets can do that we can partner with um, using this EAP guidebook either as a resource for you or we can work collaborative on this to help build or develop an EAP for a community. Something else that we can do is education and outreach. So for example, um, Silver Jackets, we can do a variety of different outreach. We can partner with states and local governments to organize activities. And these outreach activities as seen in the pictures can be targeted for families but it could also be targeted for flood professionals. It depends on the need. We have technical experience in a lot of the areas of the flood management cycle, and we can provide education and outreach opportunities as needed. Something that we do pretty often is participate in the Nevada Flood Awareness Week, um, which we haven't been able to do because of the pandemic, but in the past we've partnered up with the Nevada Division of Water Resources, and it's been a whole lot of fun. So we keep all communities in mind. We also can partner and work directly with tribes. I know Nevada has a lot of tribes in the state that we have collaborated with, and these are also partnerships that can and should be strengthened. Um, there is a lot of flood risk in a lot of the reservations in Nevada. So working through Silver Jackets and our state and local partners, we can partner with tribal nations as well and work on a variety of different projects. So in 2019, we did the Tribal Emergency Response and Floodplain Management Workshop. We basically organized a series of workshops, including one in Reno and one in Elko, where we met with tribes in the area and we just had conversations. What are the water resource challenges facing tribes in Nevada and what um, authorities or what projects and programs either from the state level or the federal level can be paired up and can we identify projects to continue building these partnerships and um, reducing flood risk overall. That is the ultimate goal. Something else that we can do and more on the technical side of things, we can assist with mapping and hazard assessments. We've done various alluvial fan mapping studies, including one for the Carson Water Subconservancy District. And these efforts can be useful for the community. Um, it can help identify where the highest flood risk is. And then that can be used to prioritize resources and help the communities with their decision making. So these are all products that we've been able to do through the Silver Jackets program. Again, the webinar, this webinar that we are having now is a product of Silver Jackets. It's the mechanism that allows us all to be meeting here today 
and talking, exchanging information and resources, so we're happy to be here. And that concludes my presentation and Erin's presentation. Um, pending any questions, thank you all for your time. Thank you, Patricia. Erin, anything else to add uh, before we move on to our first um, pair of speakers? No, I think that's it, Patricia. You did a great job covering it. So hopefully you guys all know a little bit more about Silver Jackets now and what it is that we do. That is awesome. Um, so just as a quick cover down for this, I'm going to just articulate and then type in the chat what we uh, have planned for you today. And so once again, thank you very much for spending your time, your morning here with us. Um, our, uh, we have uh, two sets of speakers, two pairs of speakers. Um, our, our first pair of speakers is going to be led by uh, none other than Noel Laughlin. I'm going to make you the presenter, Noel, and you are able to um, pull up your slide deck, which is inserted in WebEx. And I'll use this as an opportunity to also um, tell you that uh, every participant is able to uh, – apologize for the background noise there um, – able to actually view all the different slides that we've uploaded into the WebEx by hovering uh, up at the top center of the first slide. And you'll see it says Viewing Noah Laughlin's Screen. Um, there's a drop-down menu, and several of these slides are already uploaded into WebEx. Um, the one that he, he, the reason he's sharing his screen is because there's an awesome video, you know, a little bit of uh, a little bit of boy, you know, next best thing to being there. Um, but I, I just want to mention to you all, housekeeping-wise, that as you leave this meeting, if you have to leave, uh, it'll pop up menu and it'll say, "Would you like to take the files with you?" And so you're invited to take these as handouts. Um, Noel Laughlin, and then I am going to try to um, talk a little bit about, uh, on behalf of Sarah Moore, talk a little bit about the CORE's Emergency Action Plan guidebook uh, that, that Patricia referenced. Um, after that, we have Keith Johnson. Am I correct on that? Keith, I'm going to get an audio check from you. Uh, yeah, it'll be Daniel Larson first, and then I'm the second half of that presentation. Excellent. So Daniel and then Keith. And so uh, look for that in the chat as an agenda item. And I'm going to hand it off to Noel Laughlin first. Welcome, Noel. Thank you for being here. And we're um, excited Hunter, to hear your presentation. Yeah. Before we start, yeah. I see we have a hand raised. Um, I think Michael Anderson may have his hand raised. Oh, oh awesome. Hey, there's another feature. Uh, Michael Anderson, if you raise your hand to ask a question, then feel free to jump in and ask your question. I, I, by the way, this whole morning should be interactive. I think there ought to be plenty of time for Q&A. If you have a question that's not urgent, you can type it in chat and we'll try to answer it. Uh, if you have your hand up, it looks like Michael might have just been playing with the, to the tools that we have, which is great. Um, Michael, I'll chat with you on the side using chat and hand it off to Noel. Thank you for calling that out, Patricia. Noel, uh, you're on deck. Tag, you're it. Okay, thanks, Hunter. Hi, everybody. I'm Noel Laughlin. Um, here to talk today a little bit about what's inside an emergency action plan. First off, can everybody hear me okay? Loud and clear, and we can see you okay. too. Okay, awesome. You know, scrolling through the participants list, uh, saw some, some familiar names on there, but also welcome to all the people from all across the United States. Awesome to have you guys here today. Um, so again, we're going to talk, I'm going to talk a little bit about what's inside an emergency action plan. Um, if you guys attended the, the workshop we had back in August, this is going to look real familiar. So, um, you know, maybe pay attention. There's probably a few new things in here. So, um, you know, one of the reasons we do an emergency action plan, and I'm having trouble with this slide this morning, so give me a second here. Of course, it's going to be difficult today. You might have to click on the slide before you advance. Yes, I'm trying to. There we go. Okay. Just a little little lag there. So one of the reasons that that uh, we all prepare emergency action plans is because we really never know what's going to happen. Um, you know, an, an emergency at a dam can be triggered by a, a number of different events, whether it's something like this or if it's, you know, an extreme weather event or whatever. But, uh, you know, preparing for this and then having a response plan 
that's actually functional is is a critical component of this. And so, um, you know, an EAP, you know, you kind of, what is an EAP? Well, you know, it's it's really a, a written document that identifies, uh, you know, what the, where the dam is, what it is, and then what are incidents that can lead up to a potential emergency at the dam. Um, it should identify areas that can be uh, impacted by uh, loss of the, the volume of the reservoir. Uh, it can specify pre-planned actions that should be followed to minimize you know, property damage, potential loss of life, uh, infrastructure, the water resource itself, um, you know, due to uh, a failure or misoperation of the dam. Um, it also um, states, various states have, have, you know, specific requirements for EAPs, but they typically are going to be based on the hazard classification of the dam. You know, in, in here in, in Nevada, um, you know, high and significant uh, hazard dams are required to have an EAP in place. There we go. I had a little bit of difficulty with my slide deck this morning, so bear with me here. So anyway, a dam owner is ultimately responsible for the development, uh, maintenance, and exercise of the emergency action plan. And there are guidelines and other tools uh, to, uh, to assist the owners and uh, in the development of the AP. Typically, uh, you know, city, county, state emergency management directors and, and dam safety officials are usually engaged in the, the enforcement and the creation and exercise of the EAPs. Um, you know, and dam owners should be aware that there are a number of uh, technical documents out there and, and support for the development and exercise of your emergency action plan. You know, there's uh, there are various the guidelines such as uh, BEMA document 64 that contain uh, you know basic outlines, various forms, and a step-by-step -step guideline on how to prepare the AP. Uh, dam owners should, should typically be the ones that initiate the, the EAP process. Uh, and then, you know, both emergency responders and the owners will be the users of the AP. So it needs to be a clear and concise document. Um, once the, the EAP has been prepared, it, it, it should be distributed to you know the various emergency managers in in the areas that would could be affected by a dam breach, the dam safety officials with the state, um, you know leaders of any downstream communities, uh, you know departments of transportation, you know or pretty much anyone that's directly or indirectly affected for this. And in some instances, it, it could actually even involve the federal government. Um, let's see, whoops, got okay, bear with me here. <laughs> you know, some of the key points in the EAP, it's, it's, you know, it must clearly identify and specify the dam owner's responsibilities in order to have a timely and effective action out of the, the EAP. Uh, typical responsibility of the dam owners include surveillance, and that can be, you know, monitoring at the dam, the notification, you know, phoning or texting of state, local emergency managers, officials that will be in charge of the emergency response. Um, there we go. Um, another key component in an EAP are the inundation maps. And inundation maps show areas that may have to be evacuated in, in, in the case of a dam emergency. Um, the maps should uh, facilitate you know, notification um, for downstream property owners and emergency uh, managers by displaying flood areas, uh, other data such as estimated travel times uh, for, the or for the floodwaters, sometimes peak depths, uh, velocities, uh, are also shown on those maps. 
and some of the new tools that are available, uh, you know, hydraulic modeling tools, uh, we, we have been you know, like tools like Tuflow and HEC RAS, 2D, um, SRH2D, uh, are being used to create a lot more accurate inundation maps than we previously had. Um, public awareness is is another key component uh, to an EAP. As Patricia uh, had touched on, a lot of people are not aware that they live downstream uh, from from a dam. Uh, this is a, the upper right hand corner here is an example of a, a detention basin in Las Vegas, Nevada, where uh, there are homes built directly downstream from the emergency spillway. Um, you know, typically the dam owners and local emergency responders are the, are the primary users of the EAP, but, uh, you know, public awareness is a critical component of the emergency planning process. Uh, so, you know, having a good awareness program uh, as part of your EAP and your tabletop exercises uh, is really a, a good uh, tool to make sure that it's effective. Um, oh, here we go. You know, EAPs uh, will define events that will trigger the emergency actions that are described in the EAP. And those can come from observations from the dam owner, um, such as if they see, you know, seepage or cracking. Um, it can be from extreme weather events uh, that are forecast by the National Weather Service. You know, here on the west coast of the United States, we are impacted quite often by atmospheric river events, um, you know, such as happened in 2017. Uh, you know, one of those is depicted there on the upper right hand, hand side of the screen. You know, uh, dam instrumentation, uh, such as the depesiometers that could affect, uh, you know, uh, water moving uh, you know, around or under the dam, uh, seismographs, or even video monitoring, such as the slide that I had right at the opening of the presentation. You know, uh, the earthquakes that, are, that occur near a dam site can trigger an emergency uh, response out of the EAP. And any other unusual conditions that could happen around a dam, whether it's an industrial accident or an act of sabotage or terrorism, uh, can also trigger, you know, the, the items described in an EAP. Uh, you know, other things that are contained in an EAP are a notification flow chart with names and phone numbers or email addresses of, you know, who needs to be called and in what priority, in what order. You know, where as an emergency event, uh, and dams are typically very frequent. Uh, you know, training exercises, you know, in the AP help maintain the readiness of the emergency responder staff. Um, EAP should be updated periodically, uh, particularly if you know following any changes, you know, new developments in the area, um, you know, new contact information, or uh, you know, better modeling techniques. And the EAP should actually be exercised through the tabletop exercise, as we're discussing in, in this workshop, at least every five years, just so that everybody uh, understands how it works. And also, any um, anything that doesn't work in the EAP can be modified and refined. Um, you know, also, some of the EAP should, should contain some basic data. And uh, about the dam, it's usually going to have things about, you know, like the dam height, the potential downstream area that could be affected, uh, details of the dam, you know, the height of the dam, length, uh, when it was constructed, what, what it's made of, what's the spillway type, volume impounded, you know, who owns the dam, um, directions to the dam, how to access, you know, uh, you know like rest road or other areas. And also, where uh, construction materials are stored, do you have materials such as riprap, rags that are on site that you're storing in case of an emergency, or are there commercially uh, available sites that are protected here? Those need to be identified in the AP. You 
you know, the EAP will also contain an overview of uh, like a, a flow, flow chart or descriptions of the EAP operation and the different emergency levels. And, you know, it'll lay out the roles and responsibilities of the, the dam owners. Uh, first responders and emergency managers, and those include the, the appropriate local, state, and, you know, in some cases, even federal agencies that need to be notified in case of an emergency. Um, the EAP should also include a description of the various types of, of event detection from things like observations near the dam. Again, like I, I mentioned before, extreme forecasts. A detection of earthquakes um, and any other things that, that could potentially uh, damage the dam and cause an emergency. Uh, the emergency levels uh, are, are also described in the EAP and anywhere from things like a non-emergency condition, which is, you know, a, you know, a slowly developing unusual event, event or potential dam failure. Uh, which could be rapidly developing, or something like a level three, which is an urgent event where a dam failure is either in progress or it appears to be imminent. And in that, in a case of that, then it also contains a notification flow chart that shows um, who needs to be contacted and in what order the emergency manager should be notified. So it's kind of like a you know a phone tree. Um, and again, uh, the expected actions are also described for each level of emergency in there. You know, it also gives instructions uh, on the documentation that should take place following the emergency. And it, you need to document uh, the conditions or events leading up to, uh, during and following the incident. Uh, any significant actions taken, recommendations for, uh, you know, either modifications or, or things that need to be done in future emergencies. Uh, you should also weigh the strengths and deficits uh, that you found in the incident management process so that, uh, you know, in future emergencies, uh, things will go smoother. You know, and then also any corrective actions that need to be taken um, in the implementation, you know, and all you know, things like lessons learned in that. And each EAP should have a, a maintenance plan described in there and to, to keep the EAP current. You know, uh, regular reviews of, you know, dam ownership or emergency action or emergency managers um, it's, that would trigger updates. And then also how and when periodic exercises should take place with the EAP. It also contains all the supporting documentation used in the preparation of the EAP and various appendices, you know, as shown here on the screen. So who's responsible? Um, for an EAP. Well, you know, the dam owner is ultimately responsible uh, for the initiation and preparation of an emergency action plan. You know, all the potential, uh, potentially hazardous um, and benefits from a, a emergency action plan should be laid out. Um, you know, obviously dams with potential for loss of life or damage to infrastructure or high value property um, should be uh, identified uh, by the, our regulators as high or significant hazards. And these types of dams would have higher priority and uh, would require possibly a little bit more sophisticated EAP plan. Uh, regulatory agencies are uh, responsible for the dam safety and will probably have criteria for the type uh, detail of the EAP uh, required, detail for the EAP required. And uh, it'll also, it should outline priority of major repairs. Um, the dam owners usually are legally obligated to provide uh, EAPs for, you know, like I said, the high and significant hazard dams um, in the state. And um, you know, the, the dam owners.
partners are responsible for notifications, identifications of emergencies, and then, then also any repairs that are, that are required. Um, sorry. Um, you know, also local emergency management and responders are responsible for public warning, uh, possible evacuation, uh, shelter plans, uh, if that's going to be necessary, rescue and recovery, and if it's bad enough, uh, the state would uh, declare an emergency. And then following the, the emergency status, the termination of, of the, uh, the event itself. State emergency management typically um, responsible for coordinating aid in affected areas uh, and potentially specialty assistance when requested and to notify other appropriate state agencies that could be impacted. Um, so anyway, uh, just understanding where you fit, you know, in the responsibility chain here is important. So thank you very much for your time. Um, and I will now pass the ball on to, and I'm not sure if Sarah's with us, but um, I, I'll steal the I'll just steal the ball from you. Awesome. Um, and I'm excited to be able to do that. Noel, thank you um, for, for the for the teeing that up for for us and for me. And I get the distinct uh, honor of being able to introduce someone who thought he was going to be a guest and is. Uh, sorry, Terry, you get to be in the front um, instead. I'm really excited, actually, that we have Terry Zine here. Um, and and the reason I'm excited is because he has an intimate knowledge of this presentation that Sarah was intending to give. Um, he he uh, was one of the co-authors of uh, an emergency action plan guidebook that we presented. Um, I think my interjection between me and handing off the ball to uh, to Terry will simply come in the form of kind of reiterating what Noel had to say is that you know the, the the dam operator has that responsibility and that emergencies obviously are going to start at a local level and then ele elevate to a local state and then federal level but Silver Jackets is really all about kind of helping out to meet the need before the need arises build a team before you need a team make a plan before you need the plan. <laughs> Um, and those who didn't uh, have that and would like to have some guidance on it, I think that this um, presentation will help kind of uh, reiterate some of the some of the content that you just saw Noel present uh, for Nevada. Um, so I would encourage this group that's here today to look for the similarities and the reinforced messages that you see between these two pre presentations, and also. Once again, really urge that people ask questions and type comments in the chat so that we can have a dialogue after this presentation. So if there's something that you saw, you had a question for Noel, please type it in the chat. If you have a question for Terry or for Rachel or for myself, um, please type it in the chat. Ch chatting with everyone helps everyone to learn, uh, but if you have a private chat, that's fine too. Um, Terry. With, without further ado, I'd like to introduce you and then let you tell us uh, your role at the Corps of Engineers and maybe your history with this project. And then when I hand the ball to you, again, uh, you, on the left-hand side of your screen, you'll see a vertical bar that says one. Down arrow goes forward. You can test that right now. Um, and for anyone else who is viewing this that is not a presenter, just once again, the horizontal bar at the top center gives you all of these slides as handouts, so you can view them at your own leisure and it doesn't affect anyone else's view. Terry, the floor is yours. Welcome, thank you for being here. <laughs> Appreciate it. Uh-oh. Right at the moment that we handed it off, no? Did we lose some, some audio or some uh, connection with Terry? Or was it just me? Well, I can still hear you, Hunter. You can still hear me? I don't me? know about Terry. <laughs> Uh-oh. See, maybe he was camera shy. <laughs> uh, we'll, we'll give Terry just another moment to catch up. Um, once again, um, use the chat to type questions for Noel uh, or anyone else here. Um, or maybe in the interim while Terry's getting back connected, does anybody, anybody wants to unmute their own line 
Um, there's a mute button at the bottom left. You can ask a question here live. Um, we'll give it another minute or two. Terry was the person who uh, posted the link to this emergency action plan guidebook in the chat to everyone, and he is one of the co-authors of it um, from Mississippi Valley Division, um, which is, I guess I was hoping to be have Terry tell us about that himself. Oh, goodness. Hey, Rachel, are you there? Since Noel can hear me. Yeah. Hi, everyone. This is okay, Rachel good. Odia. Okay. Um, can you hear me okay? I can. I can. Great. Good to um, see you. So actually, I, I had the pleasure of sitting in a training that Terry did on the Emergency Action Plan Guidebook. Um, it's extremely impressive, and um, I think all the, all the attendees found it really helpful. Um, so I can just sort of, uh, you know, start walking through this, and then when Terry's uh, able to rejoin, uh, he can just pick up where oh. I am. It looks like Terry's back. Wonderful. Uh, this is well, where you have backups for your backups. Back. <laughs> All right. Well, I'll, t I'll tell you so what. I'll provide a little bit of information about the background of um, this guidebook. Uh, oh, there we go. Okay. I'm That's back. My, my network connection. My network connection seems to have returned. So sorry about that. Nothing we can do sometimes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Over to Terry. We're, we're all ad we're all adapting to this virtual world. So, uh, so uh, I'll start. And uh, good morning, everyone, or good afternoon, depending on where you're at. Uh, Hunter gave me a, a really nice introduction. I am a, a Senior Program Manager at the St. Paul District Corps of Engineers. I'm a hydraulic engineer and a, a PE and a certified floodplain manager. And my uh, coworker who also worked on the development of this project is on today, uh, Ms. Bonnie Greenleaf. And she, she hates when I say this, but I think she's the real rock star behind this project. She she did a lot of work on this and we, we really, we worked together and uh, I, I couldn't have done it without her, and we, we still do these these uh, workshops, and we, we've done about 30 of them, and uh, of the, the full day-long workshops, and we've been all around the country, and it, it's, you know, it's something that, you know, it's been really useful to people, and one thing I want to say up front with this is that it is highly customizable. You know, it's not intended to be one size fits all. So, you know, that's something to keep in mind while you're watching this presentation. It was designed to be flexible and to be what you need it to be. So, you know, you know, it's not, you know, don't worry about trying to make it the way it looks or, or uh, you know, follow a set pattern. It's, it's there to help you get started. So uh, let's move on. I can do that. Okay. So, you know, this is through the, the Silver Jackets program, and this project was actually a project of the, the Minnesota Silver Jackets team because the state really wanted a, a guidebook like this. And when we looked on the Internet, we really didn't find one. We, we found examples of people's guidebooks, but we didn't find a guide for how to prepare one. And and the, the reason why that's important is what I said a, a minute ago, is that you can pick up somebody else's plan, but it may not apply to you. And you, you really need a way to get, go through this on your own. And the, the reason that's important is the most important information you have is what you already know and institutional knowledge. And so nobody's in a better position than to prepare this plan than the folks who are going to own it and use it. And so, you know, one thing I'd like to mention that maybe not may not be obvious about Silver Jackets, but it really is a team, you know, and I, I work with Minnesota and Wisconsin and North Dakota on on this. And in addition to managing other, you know, floodplain management services programs for the Corps and planning assistance to states and things like that. But the, the agencies get together and they really become a team, like any team inside of your own workplace. And it really transforms 
how you deal with emergencies and flood risk over time. And I can't stress enough about how valuable it is to work. I know Hunter mentioned, you know, you know, kind of make a team before you need a team. And that, that couldn't be, you know, that, that, that's like, couldn't be more truthful. So that, keep that in mind as well. So here are the chapters of the EAP guidebook. I'm not going to read them you know, verbatim off the slide. You can take a quick look at them. And these are the, the 15 things that, that Bonnie and I think were really important. And so keep in mind, this was developed as a flood emergency action plan guidebook. And it certainly can apply to other things as needed. And that's once again that flexibility. And so, so that if it, if it looks a bit, you know, it, it may not mention dams as, at all, but it could be applied to that if necessary. It just depends on your situation. And if you'll notice the picture, this is one of my favorite pictures. Uh, of, and it, it really sums up a lot. You know, you can see it says Water Street. And, you know, it, it tells a, a lot about us as, as a species because somebody knew that area got wet because it's named Water Street, but still there's a street there. So it, it, regarding, you know, humans, it shows we're very observant, but we're still not very good planners sometimes. And, you know, it, it's a kind of a little joke. I'm not pointing fingers. We, we all live near water. We need water. And this is a reality, but the key here is we, we need to be a little smarter about how we do things. And so it, this, this photo is just a reminder of that. And, you, you know, you're probably going to deal with these issues at some point, and it's best to, to plan for them ahead of time. So the, the purpose of the guidebook you know, it's tailored towards small and medium-sized communities or tribes, but really anybody can use it. And, you know, it's the, the idea is to provide step-by-step -step instructions, of course, that would be modified for your local requirements. And we, we recommend an eight-month process because when you start getting into some of these things, you'll find that at the local level, they, they may not be so easy to deal with, you know in terms of your, you know, at the community level, who has the authority to, you know, commit funds to things? Who has the authority to order an evacuation? You know, and a lot of these kind of things, you know, that may seem uh, obvious, but hold on for a moment. Sorry about that. The phone was ringing in the background. But uh, anyways, so it, it may seem, you know, these things may seem obvious, but when you start to get into the pressure of an emergency, you know, obvious goes out the window. And you, you really need to have a lot of these things set up ahead of time to avoid conflict amongst a group of people and to, you know, promote the efficiency of your actions. So it, it can take a little longer than you think to develop one of these things. And that, that bullet about recognizing a lot of information may exist. In, in most cases, you know, the local folks really know what the issues are, but a lot of times they really haven't documented it, and it's really valuable information. And, you know, I, I call it the Joe the Fire Chief syndrome because, you know, in a lot of smaller communities, the emergency manager might be the fire chief or the director of public works, or, or, you know, someone in town, and that person probably has a lot of knowledge, but then, you know, that person isn't going to be there forever. So it's really important to get that knowledge into a, an ordered written format that people can, you know, you can, you know, have a record of what's going on and what has gone on. And so what, one of the brilliant things Bonnie did You'll, you'll see a sample of this, and one a later slide is that each chapter includes if you only have time to do one thing. And, you know, so at, at the beginning of each chapter, you'll see that box, and at the end of each chapter is another box that has a more complete list of tasks that you might want to consider. But we recognize that, especially for smaller communities, this can be a real challenge to have the time. So. We wanted you to focus on, you know, 
if you really don't have much time, there are more important things. And, you know, don't feel bad about that because even if you have nothing now, if you if you provided and developed content for even three or four of the sections, you'll have 100% more than you have now. And it's a great start. And once you get started, it gets a little easier. And we have checklists and templates for 21 key, you know, forms. And this isn't available on the website, but I can provide disks or other media that have these forms to fill in. And we provide them in Word format, you know, native Word format, so you can edit them. And there's also fillable PDFs, plus there's links on the disk, and there's, there's other references you may find useful. And so that, that bottom bullet is really important. You know, the hard part's getting started. And, and you probably will have to make changes, probably on an annual basis, but once you have it done, it's much easier. So personnel involved in preparing an EAP. Now, this, this gets confusing to people sometimes because when we bring this up, they'll say, well, you know, doesn't the county plan cover us? And, you know, the state has a plan and the county has a plan. But the way to think about this is what would you do in your community if you were faced with a flood threat? And, or, you know, and so, you know, there, there may be a variety of people who need to be involved in planning this and in executing the actions you outline. And so one of the things we found is that a key person is the county emergency manager because that for a couple of reasons. First of all, they're a full-time professional who re really understands these things and they, they probably know a lot of the local people already, but also I think this was mentioned in the by, by Mr. Laughlin, that, you know, to declare an emergency and get assistance, you have to follow a process. And that process is local, county, state, to federal. And when the resources are overwhelmed at one level, you can make the request to the next level. And so, you know, that, that uh, county EM is basically the pivot point because they would have a connection to the state duty officer, and so they, they would understand the process. So, so that person is really important, but all these other people are as well. And one thing we, we would try to emphasize is that, you know, we, we've done a bunch of these and there've been various uh, implementation strategies. And the best way and the most valuable plan you will have is if you develop it locally. And we have had instances where uh, consultants have assisted and that, that's fine as long as the local folks have a lot of involvement, because th this is for you to use and for you to understand. And the best way to do that is if the local folks develop it. And I said, even if, as I said, even if it's a little rough at first, that's fine. And you, you can always come to us to get some assistance if necessary. And uh, if, it, if it really is overwhelming, you know, by all means, you know, seek help from whoever else you need. But it's really best if you prepare this on your own. So here's the slide again with the sections and this one, that there's some highlights on, on what, uh, you know, Bonnie and I have been doing this for a while and what we think are the, the most important. If, if you really have a limited amount of time, you might want to focus on those orange or red uh, line items and the, the four that, you know, we, we used to just have four, five, six, and seven highlighted. And I, I think uh, whoever prepared this slide deck may have also gone to the communications and training. I mean, those are very important as well. And, and that's why we're here today, I think. And, but in terms of a, you know, really getting started. That's precisely, you know, that's precisely correct, Terry. That is exactly what today is about, and that's why she highlighted those very things. So to think about these highlights and to think training and exercises, even this, which is just a webinar on how important it is, I think is 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 a critical component. Didn't mean to interrupt. I just wanted to say, yep, you intuited correctly. That is exactly what Sarah was hoping for. 
So welcome everybody, and I'm glad you're here to look at these orange items because this is part of what we're looking for. Thanks, Hunter. So here's an example of a couple of the things I mentioned that um, here's a, a chart of, you know, flood organization personnel and the, the kinds of information that you might find to be important. And, you know, that first column after the name, nowadays, you know, cell phone, that, that's critical because, you know, emergencies don't happen at noon on Wednesday. They happen at 2 a.m. on Saturday. I mean, that just seems to be the way things are. And you really need to be able to get a hold of people, you know, quickly and directly. And, you know, office phone numbers may not be enough or email may not be enough. So it's something to keep in mind. And so, and here, here's an example of the, uh, you know, that box. If you only have time to do one thing in, in, this ch in chapter four, you know, this is probably the most important thing to do. And so that this highlights how we try to guide you a little bit. And here, here's another, some other forms. This is, you know, it's hard to see at this scale, but it's an organizational chart and a calling tree. And, you know, people in smaller communities tend to panic when they see this org chart because it has, you know, like 25 boxes or something. And we realize that that could be a challenge or probably is and you may be only able to fill, you know, the top boxes in these columns, that, and that's okay because, you know, you, you, have to, you have to deal with what you have, and, you know, there's, there, there's ways to maybe get around that. You know, you, you might have uh, agreements with nearby communities or, you know, maybe with the county, or perhaps you can start to fill in some of these positions with volunteers in your community even if they aren't, you know, the public employees at the moment. You know, in one example, we had, uh, uh, I think, a, a school administrator or, or an accountant at a school that really could serve on the finance part of this, you know, or did serve in that role. And it's, you know, maybe you have, you know, retired businessmen or retired executives in the community that can help with some of the administrative tasks. So, you know, be creative about filling this in, and and don't worry if you don't have a name in every box when you start. It's once again, as you get into the process, you'll start to think of more of the more things that you need. And as you you know, that getting started is the tough part, but just a, it's just a guide. So, and it it follows I think the National Incident Management System. So it's it's pretty complete. So it's. Uh, but but don't don't be scared by it. Just uh, you know, take a look at the entries and see what you can do with it. So, you know, here here's more on the the contact list and and uh, you know these are just consideration of some of the people you may want to have. It just once again it depends on your local situation. And one one of the things that I would point out is that. Uh, you know, things like utility companies, you know, nowadays, it, you know, people who the utilities or are responsible for them can live a state or two states or three states away from you. And, you know, you may need to get a hold of the, the you know, gas company or sewer and water or, or a railroad or some other utility in a hurry. And it's good to do the research now because, when you're in that emergency, it's really tough to find these things out in a hurry. So, you know, keep that in mind when, when you're filling these in, not, not to neglect some of these things. And so, okay, so this next checklist, outside contacts. So I think you saw a few of those on the previous slide. And, you know, just, you know, repeat the importance of, you know, keeping these things current because, you know, once again, in an emergency, it, it's pro probably the last thing you want to do is start trying to find find people and find phone numbers, and it's it's just that's not the time to do it. It's it's really this this may involve a lot of the effort 
and the planning stages and, and when you're developing your guidebook, but it's definitely worth the time. And, you know, don't don't be shy to ask your county EM or even your folks for some help with this if you need it, because everyone has different contacts, and it's good to, to tap into the, this, uh, you know, this wealth of information that other people might have. So then one of, one of the, you know, things that this may, makes this a little more unique is that, you know, Chapter 6 of our, our guidebook is on flood information. And once again, the previous presenter talked a little bit about having information available and looking things up. And it might be flood inundation mapping. It might be, you know, what, what are your local river gauges, you know, how to get the, how to access that. Um, you know, any other studies that might be available to you, like FEMA flood insurance studies and their flood maps. And one of the really important things with, with that is also knowing how to use it and what does it mean. You know, and the, what I mean by that is you may have a, you may be lucky enough to have a river gauge in your community, but that gauge is at one point. And if, if your city is five miles long or your connection to the river is five miles long, the water surface profile along that five miles isn't going to be flat. And so, so you need to be able to relate the data you're getting at that gauge to that whole reach of the river that's in contact with your community. And that is where this, uh, you know, maybe some of the FEMA studies can help or maybe the weather service. And if there really is no existing data, this is where you can start to work with your Silver Jackets partners, maybe like the core, to do a, a study for your community under the Floodplain Management Services Program, or maybe under the Silver Jackets Program. So, you know, and a, another aspect I always mention of, you know, flood elevations and data is the, the gauge datum. And what we mean by that is, especially for the vertical datum, is that the elevation of that gauge was set, you know, to some survey point. And right now the current datum in the United States, the vertical datum is the datum of 1988, NAVD 88. And the problem is your data sources may not all be referenced to that. You know, that's some work you can do if they're not, but it depends where you are in the country, you know, but in St. Paul, that conversion, for example, from 29 to 88 is, I don't know, 0 0.13 feet. It's not a big difference. If you make a mistake, the consequences aren't that bad. But if you're in the Red River of the North, up in uh, northwestern Minnesota, northeastern North Dakota, the difference can be one and a half to two feet. And in that valley, the slope is so minimal that if you if you make a two foot error, you could be flooding ten miles on either side of the river. And so, it's really important to make sure people who are building emergency levees and who are setting elevations on gates and you know, doing other things, really understand what, you know, that, that data and understand the datum involved because, you know, you know it's, you, you, if you're putting up an emergency levy, you might only have one chance to do it. And if you're really off, it, it could be disastrous. So, you know, making sure people understand these things is very important. And so why we're here today, Chapter 14, Training and Exercises. So, you know, this is, this is an ongoing process. It's not just, you know, one, one and done. It's, a, it's something that you really need to exercise on an annual basis. And it, it's great to get started in your emergency action plan process with a tabletop exercise where you'll really get to understand where some of your gaps are. And... It's certainly not to point fingers at anybody. It's just to to see what what your you know how your response works and if you're missing information. And so it's it's best to you can do that at the beginning of the process, but it's also really a good idea to do this on an annual basis, just to make sure you have all the current people 
and all the current phone numbers and all the current situations defined for yourselves. And so this is a picture of the cover. I think this might be the last slide that um, of the, the current guidebook. We are on version four, so this is current. If you go to the website I put in the chat about 30 minutes ago, th this is what you will come to. And as I said, you, you'll see the guidebook. And, you know, one thing about the guidebook is it's it's about a quarter of an inch thick. It's it's not meant to – it's meant to be a, a more simple approach. You know, we, we didn't want to give you another three or four inch thick binder of paper that people would ignore and, you know, put in a box or recycle right away. This is really meant to be used. And we, we tried to remove things like jargon and, and unnecessary detail so that it's something that a person could sit down and you could probably flip through the, the whole guidebook in an evening to see what kind of things you would need to, to put into it. But, you know, I'll, I'll, I can't say how uh, enough how important it is that, that the communities get their own information into, into these, you know, pages and into these forms because that's, that's really where the knowledge is and that's where the action has to be, to be effective. And so, okay, so there, I guess there's some more slides here. I well, there, see there are two, well, there are two, there are two more slides and, and, and uh, after this one, um, and, and it simply kind of rounds out what you've already been saying, which is that it takes a long time to start, but it does not take as long to update. So it is, you know, just to be being aware and then the last slide, just so you're aware, Terry, that um, it is, you know, it's all about the little links, which I will cut, copy, and paste into the chat as well. So I wanted to give okay. you a read ahead on that one. Thanks, Hunter. Yeah, I, I didn't have quite enough time to read through the whole slide deck while, while we were setting this up <laughs> on the fly this morning. So, yeah, so we, we mentioned earlier, you know, we have an eight-month recommended planning process. And as you start to get into the details of this, I think you'll understand why we recommend that. And it's really not meant to be for one person to sit down in their cube and crank this thing out, this plan, although it could be started that way. It's really going to have to be a team effort for it to be complete and effective. And so once again, I'm not going to read everything on this slide, but I think it gives you a really good idea on the kind of things you need to consider and the kind of things you will need to do. And once again, needs to be customized for each community, but it, this gives you a guide on how to go about the process. And, and once again, I, I say, look at the, the last part. Don't be afraid to ask people to review it. This is the kind of thing you can send to folks at the core or you can send to your county EM or your state folks or whoever you know and whoever might be on your team with silver jackets. And if you don't know who your silver jackets representative is, you know, contact your, your local district of the Corps of Engineers and they, they will be able to help you with that. Or contact your, you know, someone at the state like Erin uh, had started out this meeting. She'll probably know who to talk to as well. But by, by all means, you know, have some have outside parties re review your plan. So these are some of the things we've learned over the course of doing all of these workshops. You know, getting started is the most difficult step because, you know, people are resource constrained and you may not understand where to start. And, and that's why we have the guidebook. But getting started is definitely the most difficult step. And then, as, as I mentioned earlier, it's vital to have the local emergency manager involved. And I would even say that that should be the county emergency manager as well. And we understand that communities are limited by human resources. And that's part of the reason for the eight month time frame on the process, but also you know, once again, if you need some assistance, you, you please reach out to, to folks that, that might be able to help you. And then, as I said also, you know, follow up. You know, this isn't a one and done thing. This is something that you should 
visit on an annual basis. And once it's developed, it may not take you a whole lot of time annually to to revisit and update things, but it, it's certainly worth your time. And what we found universally, the best information is usually what the community already knows. You know, we're, we're not here to, you know, be prescriptive and directive and talk at you about a whole bunch of things because we know that y you have a better understanding of your situation than we do. We, we can provide advice on how to build a levy. We can provide all sorts of other technical resources, but you know, the best information is what you already know. It's just really important to get it written down. And this next point came out a number of times. One, one other reason that it's important to determine who's in charge ahead of time is that well, we, we heard this from a number of communities is that when you start to get into an emergency, there's te there tends to be one person who thinks they're in charge or should be in charge. And so when we're at these workshops, we get pulled aside quietly during lunch and told, no, that's not the right person. They think they are, but they're not. Well, it's best to have these sensitive conversations locally while there isn't an emergency. And it, it's, you know, you'll know best locally how to deal with it. And, you know, you, you may, may ruffle a few feathers for a short time, but the time to do that is not in the emergency. And then... These are really good to combine with a tabletop exercise because it lets you test what you have in your plan. And it will point out where gaps are and where, where you may need some more information or may need to change a process or change a phone tree or some other things like that. And the other thing you may find through a tabletop exercise is that organizations have resources you didn't even know about. And you know, we, we were doing a workshop in Moab, Utah, and we we invited the National Park Service. And so the local manager for the park showed up and he said, well, you know, we have some heavy construction equipment stored over in XYZ place and we have some operators and, you know, we can bring in some heavy equipment if needed. And nobody knew that. So it was really great to have that person there and he could offer that up. And so here, here are the links to that were mentioned earlier. And you know, links come and go. If, if once again, if you're having problems with these things, you can call me. I, I put this link in the chat earlier, and that will get you to our public-facing website. And if you go down the left side, there's some some other links. There will be a link to this guidebook, and I tested it this morning while the presentation was going. So I know that that was working, and you can always contact the you know the National Silver or Nevada Silver Jackets team, and you know or you know Bonnie and I would always be glad to give you some assistance. And I, I like this quote. I, I put this in, I think in the you know the end of the the guidebook, and it's it's really important to prepare for these situations because. It, you know, the, the things that, you know, and Bonnie talks a lot about this when we do our eight-hour presentation about what what can go wrong if you don't prepare. And it's just, it's things you can't even anticipate. And so the better prepared you are for these emergencies, you know, the better that your communities will be served and, you know, less mistakes will be made. That's the whole idea. At the end of the day, we're all here for the same thing. That is to protect life and property. And this is one thing you can do for yourselves to really, really help that along. And I think that is the last slide in this presentation. It is, and I am so glad that you're here, Terry. I know that you <laughs> did not expect to be uh, the presenter of this, but it's evident that you've had a lot of experience with it. Um, and it's obviously evident because this last slide references none other than Terry's on. So, um, <laughs> folks, Terry is definitely a resource to reach out to. Um, but we, I, I think the take home point for me is to make sure that, um, that this whole audience, and it's not just Nevada folks, 
on this call, which is a, a benefit of WebEx, um, uh, this virtual space that we're using, um, you know, that, that we would like to be able to provide a, a service and a resource, and especially one in which everyone feels as though they have the autonomy and the power to be able to do work for themselves. Um, and so if we can, again, build a team before we need a team and build a plan before you need the plan, um, I think that's probably about as good a, a, um, a message as we could possibly have. Terry, I, I hope that you'll put your, in addition to having this slide here, which people could take home with them, I hope that you'd put your contact info in the chat. Uh, I do see uh, some conversations happening. Uh, let me ask Noel, since Noel was the first half of this presentation, Noel, do you have anything more in closing after having seen this? And you and Sarah Moore had worked really hard on having a, you know, a, a left seat, right seat, or a left hand, right hand, whatever you want to call it, um, a presentation. Was there anything else that you wanted to add in closing from your combo presentation? Um, here, let me get my video on here. Uh, thanks, Hunter. Um, and thank you, Terry, for filling in for Sarah today. You did a great job. Um, no, thank just, you. Uh, you know, really stressing the importance of an emergency action plan. I saw some great chat going on in there and just making sure it's current. And uh, these tabletop exercises that we're going to be talking about are, are really critical because, um, you know, I think like Terry mentioned, nobody thinks about these things until they happen at, you know, 3 a.m. on a Saturday morning on a holiday weekend. And uh, it's really important to have, uh, you know, everything working, you know, at least have, have gone through it. Nothing's ever going to be perfect. And there's always going to be, you know, things that go you know, wrong. There's going to be challenges that people uh, come through. But these tabletop exercises are really important in at least identifying some of the major ones. So thank you, uh, Hunter, and thank you, Terry. I appreciate everybody being here today. And everybody be safe. You're welcome. Glad to help. Okay. So, as I said in the chat, and I'll read out again uh, in the chat, which I'm encouraging you to go to, uh, we'll take a five-minute break after Terry's uh, – we'll take a five-minute break now after Terry and Noel's presentation. Um, I would love to see what did you, what was your aha moment. Oh, you know, a question, a comment, a thought, or even a suggestion for us. Um, and, and share that before you walk away and take your five-minute human needs break fluid leveling, if you will. Um, come back for Danny and Keith's presentation, which I'm going to queue up right now so that you can see their names, and that will be there. Uh, but I'll also encourage you to click the link in the chat and download the game. I mean, simulation that we have uh, that was focused on Nevada flooding and uh, try, trying to tie together some of the issues of dam safety and operations and levees and uh, and all of the business that goes into flood management and flood risk reduction. So, five minute break. Uh, right now it is 12.18 uh, your time, I suppose, or is that my time? Ten, okay, there you go. We're in Illinois. Like I said, we're on the road, uh, by the way. We're Zooming. My daughter and I are teaching and learning and sharing online, and that's the benefit of this uh, medium. So, five-minute break, uh, so that puts us at uh, 23 after, maybe 25 after. We'll give you a couple extra minutes. Uh, in the meantime, type in some chats, introduce yourself to your teammates. Thank you so much, Noel and Terry, and we'll see you back in a few minutes.
Okay, we are back from our break, and my hope is that you can hear me. And I guess for a moment, I'll turn on my video again so that you can see. Hello. Um, once again, uh, my name is Hunter Merritt, and I am moderating and helping to facilitate this webinar. Uh, and by that, what I mean is I'm monitoring chat and encouraging people to use it as a space to uh, communicate with each other on what do you have in your community for an EAP? Does he, do you have one? Do you know where it is? Is it current? Tabletop exercises and, and how important they are. We'll have more conversations about opportunities in the future, and I'll put in a little plug here and say, this is not the only webinar that Nevada is going to have. I believe that we are working toward another webinar about a month from now. So please do stay tuned. Aaron Warnock is a point of contact you can reach back to here in this meeting um, and find out a little bit more about what we can do to take what we've learned today another step further and work with each other to be prepared um, for whether it's dam safety related or just community related, uh, we can reduce each other's risk and reduce our own risk um, by being prepared with an EAP. Um, with that, I am hoping everyone's back and that I'm handing it off to Danny. I want to get a mic check from Danny and from Keith. So can we see you and hear you? Hello. Yep. Hello, Danny. Um, and you're the presenter. You're the presenter, Danny, which means that you're going to advance your slides with the, with the vertical bar on the left. Yep. Uh, excellent. And then Keith, we got you? Yep, I'm here. Great. Good morning, and thank you for being here. Uh, once again, the floor is yours. Thank you so much for teaching us a little bit about EAPs in Nevada um, for our uh, national audience as well as our state audience. Okay, the floor is yours. All right. Thanks, Hunter. Uh, hello, everyone. I am Danny Larson. I'm a water resource specialist with the Nevada Division of Water Resources uh, in the Dam Safety Program. Um, this presentation is more geared towards the review process, uh, kind of near the last 25% of the completion of the document. Uh, we're, what we're looking for, uh, what we want to see, and common things that we, we send things back to be corrected or, I don't know, uh, suggestions that we'd like. Um, a lot of this stuff that's going to be mentioned has been gone over by uh, Noel and uh, Terry, uh, and I will contribute my, my limited knowledge. I was the uh, intern for the three years leading up to March, and then I've just been brought on full time. So. Um, I've recently filled in to Erin Warnock's vacancy that she left. Uh, so, yes, I am the new uh, primary emergency action plan reviewer uh, for the state of Nevada at this moment. Uh, that doesn't mean that I will review everyone, but I will most likely see them. Um, but, yeah, with, with that, I'll, uh, I'll go to the next slide and we can kick this guy off. So in Nevada, we have uh, 653 dams, uh, 156 of those being high hazard, 89 significant hazard, and 407 low hazard. I'm sure you can guess why uh, there are so many low hazards uh, due to the fact of uh, being one of the lowest population density states in the country, but uh, it still should be noted that we have very high concentrations of high hazard dams in fairly high uh, populated areas. Um, and it also needs to be uh, stated that hazard condition is based solely on what is below the dam. It doesn't have anything to do with what's around uh, the reservoir that's created or in the watershed. It's if there is a house or a neighborhood or a school or a freeway, like that's all has to be below the dam to factor into the high hazard or whatever hazard uh, rating. Um, and then uh, with the hazards, low hazards are generally going to be unnoticed. Un, uh, people are going to be unimpacted uh, with a failure of a low hazard dam, where the only real loss would be to um, to uh, like non-equitable um, things. So you'll you'll damage property maybe, but no no harming of uh, economical. Uh, items. <laughs> Significant hazard is more, um, it's, if it fails, it could damage a building, it could 
uh, cause some economical damage, but it won't cause any loss of life or um, it, it'll just be a an issue that could cause um, delays or uh, losses of uh, profits or however whoever owns the dam, whatever's downstream. High hazard is much more risky. Uh, a lot of these are located near high density uh, high densely populated areas um, or have the ability to inundate anything below that that point below the dam. So in Nevada, uh, we require emergency action plans for all significant and high hazard dams. Currently, uh, all of our high hazard dams have an EAP, though not are all up to date. Uh, significant hazard dams, we currently have 73 of the 89 uh, submitted, so we are actively working to uh, fill those holes in that, that regard. And we even have 16 low hazard dam or emergency action plans. And Though they aren't required, we do recommend that all dams in Nevada have some sort of plan for if some, something were to go wrong. So, I mean, it's not required, but that's definitely something we would recommend. Uh, for our operating procedures, we generally follow this NAC uh, 535.320 uh, uh, with emergency action plans emergency action plans in mind, uh, specifically 3A, which states uh, that we follow uh, the format presented by the Federal Emergency Management Agency, FEMA, in the Federal Guidelines for Dam Safety Emergency Action Planning for Dams, which is FEMA 64, as commonly referred to, um, or an uh, equivalent format approved by the State of, Engin the State of Engineer. Um, we follow pretty closely uh, FEMA 64. Uh, it's pretty intertwined in our uh, checklist that we go through whenever we review a dam. Uh, and we'll run through that in a little bit. But, I mean, we, we act because of this and through this. So we aren't just making up rules and we aren't just sending things back because we don't agree with it. It's, it has a purpose. And in FEMA 64, uh, it requires that all uh, dam owners have an EAP and an inundation map created to their guidelines, that all uh, emergency action plans submitted are reviewed um, to ensure they're in accordance with these guidelines, that they're all kept up to date, and that um, emergency managers, uh, the National Weather Service, and the Department of Emergency Management all receive a a copy of this plan. Um, they also require, uh, we require notification whenever this emergency action plan is implemented and that all uh, of these plans are updated at least every five years. Uh, this is an example of hazard creep where uh, this is currently a uh, inundation map area in uh, the Denver uh, rural area. Uh, this is taken in 1955. This dam would most likely be a low hazard dam just due to the uh, lack of development in that area. Uh, and then you fast forward 40 years, and this um, all pops up. So, like your your emergency action plan, if it was made in 1955, or I mean, just in an area that isn't developed, that doesn't mean it's not going to be developed in the future. And that's another understatement to why we need these to be updated. And here are some other examples in Nevada. This is a Pittman Anthem at Detention Basin in Las Vegas. This, I mean, 2003 was uh, an empty desert. This, uh, the, uh, in the bottom right, that's where the dam uh, location is. This is a storm retention pond. Uh, fast forward a little bit, uh, you get a lot of development. So this, this the emergency action plan may have accompanied the uh, application for the dam, but that, that needs to be updated to reflect the downstream conditions. And then more currently, I mean, that's hundreds of homes within an inundation area that may not be accounted for in the emergency action plan. So the, you just need to follow up with anything that happens at or around your dam, because your dam is 
controlling or limiting the water from reaching these areas that uh, that extra flow of water can definitely cause significant damage to. Here's another example, a um, little bit different. This is an Elko uh, Chester Dam. The dam's in the middle, uh, kind of surrounded by a few homes. Uh, this started out as a low hazard dam, and then due to the development, was uh, increased to a high hazard dam. Uh, not too much changed, um, but this high hazard dam created um, an issue for the uh, dam owner, and they eventually decommissioned it because it's, yeah, it's filled in. Like they, there's, it, high hazard dams create a lot of issues that when developed around, it just, it's a, a domino effect almost. So this is kind of going more into um, what Noel and uh, Terry uh, covered. Um, I'm trying to cover it from the perspective of what we specifically look for. Um, it doesn't, I'm not trying to, uh, overstate anything that they said because that is all very important but this is like the specific um, things that we'll flip through to like try to catch our eye these are the, the important things that we want to see so we do want to see the designated roles and responsibilities we want everyone that's involved to know what they're doing before the emergency is an emergency uh, we want the five-step process to be delineated uh, just to know what step follows what action, um, going from the detection, the termination of uh, the hazard, how critical it is, uh, to the notification and make like the phone call making, uh, knowing who's calling who and what their job is after their phone call, uh, what actions uh, need to be initialized at least uh, if um, certain uh, events are unfolding, and then the termination and follow-up can sometimes be the most important part of the document. And also the inundation map. This, this is one of the most key pieces to every document we get because this will illustrate who uh, or where the dam is, who's in danger, and to uh, some emergency responders that might not know exactly where this dam is, it could be critical into uh, helping their decision-making processes. So common roles that we like to see, um, the dam owner, we want them to be, uh, I mean, uh, in a perfect world, they would be the one who observed the uh, the incident, and they would be able to report it directly through the emergency action plan. Obviously, that's not entirely possible, because the dam owner is most likely not going to be living at or around the dam. So if they have a, uh, a system in place to where a uh, phone number is posted somewhere near the dam to where if some fisherman or hiker sees something wrong, there's at least something that they can do to help report that. And then they're like just going down the list, like they should be responsible in determining uh, the hazard, the emergency level. So if it's just a little uh, erosion rills pop up, that they could be level one, potential failure, you get some piping or a, a wet spot on the uh, downstream face. Or if they're actively water pouring out of the dam, they just need to know where to go to make these decisions, or at least know who to ask to help make these decisions. They also need to be the first to make the call and to activate the emergency action plan. And then they're most likely going to be the, uh, the people that are at the site first. So they need to be able to communicate effectively to those who are working on either getting to the dam or uh, fitting their their role to the emergency. The incident commander should be appointed beforehand, as Terry was mentioning, as a very uh, important part of this document. Uh, they should be the primary contact for any uh, additional issues that rise up. Um, they will be the command center, so like they're they're going to be operated around um, and definitely helping out with emergency determination and coordination. Um, they're also most likely going to be deciding when to terminate. This is still up to the, um, the document creator. So, I mean, every case has its own solution, but it's most likely going to be the person in charge who's going to have total control of what to do and when to do it. Um, and they're also, uh, we, we like to have them 
involved in the preparing process and the updating process. Uh, and our, our responsibility in an emergency should be labeled. Uh, we, we are not there to do everything for a dam owner in an emergency, and that's we've, we've had to do, and uh, Keith Johnson will cover that in a little bit, but we are really only there to advise uh, emergency situations to help make decisions. Uh, we are not the final decider, uh, but we would just like to be included on these emergencies just to be able to answer questions, ask questions that may not have been asked already, um, and just be able to assist as much as we can. Uh, and then the emergency manager, they need to uh, have some sort of connection to the media and to uh, just the local, they know the local uh, emergency responses better than anyone else. So they're a very key, uh, key piece of personnel that needs to be involved uh, pretty heavily in these kinds of uh, documents. Uh, this document was used uh, in an earlier presentation as well, but this is something that should be included uh, in an earlier uh, page on this document, just to kind of outline visually and, uh, I mean, with words, that each step leads to another. And it's it's not uncommon to switch between emergency levels as things unfold. So just to have that illustrated somewhere to simplify someone's mind in a time of chaos is definitely something that's highly recommended. Uh, going into a little bit more of uh, the building of the, the emergency action plan, the detection needs to be outlined. Uh, who could possibly see it should be listed and how they could possibly get in contact with someone, uh, emergency action plan holder. So if that's a phone number on a, a, a structure near the dam, uh, if it's a sign posted on a fence, something like that needs to be uh, listed there. And then there needs to be um, a list of follow-up actions for items like earthquakes, uh, high, high uh, storm flow, um, just unusual weather patterns that could cause uh, increased water levels. Those all need to be pre-planned for just to know that there's someone with eyes on uh, the structure at any potential time of emergency. Uh, the determination guide, this is trying to simplify any person's uh, decision making. Uh, because obviously if this is happening and you're one of the only people at this structure, it's going to be a lot more difficult, especially if you don't have a huge background in uh, dam dam safety or dam operation to know what action should be responded to in what way. So this, this is just a, a list of potential failure uh, modes that could happen and how to respond to them. And I mean, these, the more detailed, the better. Uh, definitely flowing from a bigger event to a situation is, is nice. Um, I like to look at these from a perspective of someone who has no idea how a dam works or uh, ha doesn't know the failure modes of an earthen dam. Like it's, it's easy to think about uh, like a concrete Hoover dam type structure failing because you, you think of cracks and uh, water shooting out. But of uh, earth dams, there are so many ways that it can lead to a failure that you just, it needs to be outlined. And there needs to be pre-planned actions and follow-up actions that are easily accessible and outlined. And then the notification chart. This, this is um, a key piece that is covered in our checklist. Um, we like to have a, a separate emergency act, uh, notification chart for each level of emergency, uh, from the non-emergency to a potential failure to a developing failure. Um, this is an example of uh, our drafted uh, South Fork EAP uh, notification chart. Uh, just very linear. Um, trying to make this as simple as possible. Um, I mean, if you can't navigate it um, cold, if you can't have your neighbor who has nothing to do with anything engineering look at this and know that if he was in this position, who he would have to call, then you have to make it more simple. It's, it's not, not complicated. It shouldn't be complicated. This is one of the most straightforward um, roadmap 
steps, essentially, that, that should be on your document. Uh, expected actions need to be outlined. I was kind of mentioning this before in the determination chart, but all um, potentially unusual events should be planned for, or at least have an action to have someone go look at the dam after or before these events. Uh, these, all of these events need to be somewhat outlined so there's uniformity to how they're performed. Uh, and then orders for if something is noticed, what to do next. And that could be, uh, there could be several pre-planned actions or just one uniform for uh, a specific individual if they happen to live near the dam to just know to go look out at the dam just to see if there's something unusual that needs to be acted upon. And then expected act, well, this, this is the same slide. And then the termination phase. This is, again, I, I said this earlier, but it's one of the more uh, important uh, pieces of the um, the process. Uh, you need to have the person responsible for um, terminating this uh, series of actions outlist, uh, outlined and listed in this document. You need to have their actions as to what needs to be met in order to qualify for this and then the follow-up actions. So if, if this emergency action plan is terminated, meaning that there's no longer an, uh, a threat of the dam failing, there needs to be post-emergency uh, actions outlined that can lead to maybe increasing stability of the dam or even completely decommissioning the dam. But those, those need to be outlined and, and a separate roadmap needs to be uh, somewhat pr provided for that. Obviously, every uh, situation will be different, so you can't plan for everything, but this needs to be at least kicked in motion uh, in step five. And then in one of the first uh, appendices, uh, you want an uh, inundation map. And these inundation maps, they, they are usually the most expensive and uh, frustrating part of the uh, gathering for this document, uh, but they're also some of the most important and yeah, useful for emergency responders who are uh, assisting with evacuations. So this is another example from our South Fork uh, Emergency Action Plan. Uh, this, uh, there are separate events. Uh, they have a series of four um, separate inundation maps that are provided in this slideshow. So this one is the main dam uh, on a sunny day, so assuming that the reservoir is full and there's no incoming, no excess incoming water, and the dam is just completely disappearing. So how, however this water flows, you want that to be illustrated and um, labeled on this document with all um, pertinent structures, important uh, infrastructure. And I mean, any information you put on this is going to be helpful. So if you leave off um, the max depth or velocity, like that's you just you could get a, a puddle of water on your doorstep, or you could not have a door to open at all. Like you, the more information that's on here is is beneficial to everybody. So here's another uh, illustration where the main uh, feature is depth. So the color uh, responds to depth on a sunny day uh, with maximum uh, uh, reservoir storage. And then going forward, this dam has a saddle dam on its uh, north, uh, northern side. So that's another mode of failure. That's essentially an, another dam. It may not be the main dam, but it's a point of failure. So that needs to be accounted for. Um, this is uh, an inundation map of the probable maximum flood that uh, breaches the saddle dam. So the water velocities and depth may be less than the main dam, but they're still important to know where they touch. And the more of these you add, the better it is for everyone. Uh, but if they're uniform, it's a lot easier to compare them to each other. And here's a checklist, uh, well, here's our checklist that we use for our inundation maps. Um, so we, we go through and, I mean, obviously we check to see if it's got the 
basic map elements, north, uh, north arrow, uh, bar scale, uh, it's clear. If it's clear where the water is going to flow, that's really important. Um, does the inundation map show a quali uh, qualification stating that the limits are not necessarily accurate? Because that's, that's important. That's a legal kind of point that you need to take. This is an illustration of what could happen, not a prediction. Well, it is a prediction, but it's not telling you what's going to happen. It's just an outline of where people need to be worried. Local roads, drainages, and other landmarks should be labeled. Um, on the other uh, inundation map examples, they had they weren't bold and uh, easy to find because it's so zoomed out. But it did have the IED listed, and it had Carlin listed. It doesn't have individual water um, or individual property owners, just due to the fact that it's so big uh, of a scale that that's all you would need for this kind of emergency, because all of those communities would most likely have to be evacuated in that scenario. Uh, channel crossings. We need these to be. We prefer these to be taken at critical points downstream, uh, roads, crossings, uh, schools. And beginning of a neighborhood, like just important points where it's a checkpoint. So if the water reaches that point, you know it's been however long since the event took place. Uh, and then you could predict how far down and how deep, how fast the water is moving. So these are not everything that we need on there that we look for, but they're definitely some really important things that we will send back an emergency action plan if it's submitted without them. The common mistakes uh, that are sent, we, we send them back for. Um, the most common is sent with just a PDF. Uh, this is likely just a draft that is sent, but we will always make sure that in our communication back to them after our review that uh, to be officially approved, it needs to be submitted in a tab binder and accompanied with an electronic copy. So that's something that we can't take if it's a print out just loose leaf paper. We won't accept that. Um, uh, usually confusing or uh, insufficient notification chart. Um, these can be overly complex. Uh, too many calls for a dam owner or anyone in, uh, in specific. Uh, but we want the dam owner or whoever's on, uh, on site to be focused on the dam more than making phone calls. That's the, that's the real reason behind it. Um, and then incorrect contact information is very common. Uh, we have a few, like our, uh, our after hours number is commonly mistaken, um, as well as uh, our office phone. So that, those are two things that I usually correct, um, but I can't speak for other people's contact information. It's not my job to verify everyone's phone number on your notification chart. So if, if ours is wrong, it's likely that others could be wrong. So that's a, a usual statement that I'll include uh, just to verify uh, others' contact information. And then uh, inundation map. Uh, this is more so a problem for people who uh, may not be able to afford uh, a professional inundation map. And we, we have resources to help with that, but they need it needs to be more than just a drawn outline of where the water could flow. Like this, this is a, a map for emergency responders to know where they're needed. So if, if it's missing observation lines uh, at key structures, that, I mean, if it has observation lines, that's important. But it needs to be helpful. That's, that's the ultimate goal. Like these need to be useful and helpful when everybody's panicking. So that's, that's kind of what I'm getting at. Um, our, all of these documents are very complex, but at the end of the day, they need to act simple. So that's really all I try to, to look for um, when I'm reviewing. Uh, if there's too much complexity or too much simplicity, I'll, I'll send it back with comments and try to uh, fit that document within the constraints that uh, our checklist is, at least. And then I, I created a list of generally what 
every emergency action plan in Nevada should have. Uh, this is not uh, inclusive, obviously. There's a lot of things that it needs to have. Um, but the most common and um, pertinent things that are in our checklist, uh, a physical copy with a tab binder and an electronic copy. We like to have tabs for everyone. We don't want it just to be submitted to, uh, with tabs to us. We would like it to be tabbed uh, to create an easier way of navigating this document in an emergency. You don't want to be flipping through pages. Uh, I don't know. You're outdoors. Like you, you want to be able to flip to that page and be able to find the information you're looking for. Next, uh, you want to clearly outline emergency actions and pre-planned responses to help with the determination of uh, emergency level. So that's that's important. You want to find out what's going to happen with this action or what's uh, what's happening in this event. Uh, the notification chart needs to be simple and clear and straightforward with verified uh, contact information. I, I don't think I need to restate that one. I covered that one pretty well. Uh, and then the inundation map, of course, needs to be helpful. That's the most important thing. And then another thing I haven't talked about yet is that you need to have plans to keep this updated. This is a living document. Every change that happens at or around your dam is impacting what happens in an emergency. So that needs to be accounted for. Um, we require it every fri uh, five years at a minimum. Um, and I think, yeah, so when to update an EAP? Uh, every five years we require it, but we like uh, to be updated any time that there's a change in personnel, contact information, alteration to a dam, uh, new downstream development. You guys saw all of the uh, hazard creep slides. That can sneak up on you and we don't want that emergency to cause more chaos than, I mean, it, it can. So as long as these items are accounted for, that's basically what I'm looking for. So here, I have two quick quiz questions. Uh, we don't have a poll uh, software or anything, but if you wanna read through this, uh, read through the answers and post uh, your answer in the chat, um, just kind of make sure you guys have been paying attention, whatever. Uh, they're not meant to be confusing, but it's it's common mistakes um, that can usually put someone into deep water when it comes to uh, emergency action plans. So what are the five steps in an emergency? I, I mean, I've covered this. I think Noel covered this. I know Terry covered this. I won't spend too long on it, but yeah, it looks like the answers are rolling in. We'll go ahead and skip to the answer. Um, it is D, detection, decision-making, notification, preventative actions, termination, and follow-up. Uh, next question. If the dam fails, who is responsible for the downstream warning and evacuation? This could be a little tricky for some people, but these are these are the questions that need to be asked before um, the document is submitted. So, the correct answer is B. Uh, the county emergency manager should be in coordination with law enforcement, and this should all be outlined in that document. And with that, I will hand it off to Keith Johnson, and uh, he will finish out the presentation. Thanks. All right, thanks, Danny. Uh, can you pass the ball over so I can move the slides up and down? Uh, so the first uh, thing I'm going to talk about real quick and try and get us through this uh, without going over too too much. Um, so the consequences of not having any uh, EAP, the biggest consequence can be loss of life downstream, and you guys can read through some of those other ones. Um, the only the other one that's you know in the event of a dam failure, um, those ones can happen. But in the event of a not you know a non-event, uh, fines and penalties from our office are also included in there. So I'm going to go over some 
uh, you know, just quickly some dams that failed. This one wasn't a dam, um, but it was a dam-like structure that failed and didn't have an emergency action plan and how much damage was done. Um, people in Nevada probably remember this in 2008 when the levee broke, or it wasn't a levee, but it's a canal, it acts kind of like a levee, uh, failed and flooded all the houses internally. Uh, and you can see from the pictures here, uh, they think it was burrowing animals that, that failed this. And had they had an emergency action plan uh, and maybe you know, a maintenance plan, they might have looked at this and uh, possibly prevented it. Um, so here's some, some recent memories of a flood. Here's 2017. We had a flood event here in northern Nevada. Um, you can see the dam on the left. That one had a lot of damage to its uh, spillway. And the dam on the right, that one's right down there uh, by UNR's campus. You know, if this was your dam and you don't have an emergency action plan, uh, this is when you start panicking. Move on to the next one. Uh, so this, this other one, uh, Marlette Spillway, uh, they had a full dam with a lot of snow and no way to operate their outlet because they hadn't operated it in years. And uh, the spillway was completely frozen up. And, and so if we had any problem with that snow melting quickly, uh, you know, rain on snow event, uh, the dam would likely overtop because the spillway was blocked. And then 21 mile dam failure on the right there, you can see uh, did fail. And I've got more on that one. So here's what 21 mile dam looked like before it failed. Uh, it's a it's a pretty pretty large dam. Um, it has a huge contributing area to it. We'll see that here in a second. Uh, you can see this. It, it's the watershed for this dam is is just massive. You can see the three dots on there, the yellow dots. Uh, the one furthest to the left is 21 mile dam. Uh, and it failed. Uh, we believe it overtopped. And it was a low hazard dam, so no emergency action plan. Um, and it flowed downstream and did a lot of damage. I'm going to show some pictures here. You can see the break. And I'm just trying to get through these quickly so that uh, I don't hold everybody around. If anybody has questions on them, they can field them to me later. Uh, so here's some pictures. So it overflowed or overtopped because the spillway was not big enough and the, the dam, the reservoir was completely full at the time of the failure. They had a lot of snow and they had a rain on snow event. And uh, the spillway did flow, but it was not enough to stop the dam from overtopping. And you can see a bunch of those pictures there of the failure. Uh, here's some damage to the, the ranch downstream. Uh, you can see it wiped off all the, you know, the, the wheel lines and then just wrapped them up into a ball. Uh, that piece of ice came 21 miles down a creek bed and smacked into the side of that house and knocked it off of its foundation. And then you can see this is another, the other two pictures on the right are dams, or uh, the dam downstream, its spillway after it passed it. And that one almost failed but did not fail. And here's downstream as well. It wiped out the highway. Um, we're not sure if it was just the dam. There was a lot of flooding in the whole area, but it definitely didn't help. It wiped out the highway and the railroad. And here's another dam uh, that had problems. Uh, this one is in eastern Nevada. And uh, so they had, again, a lot of water coming into the reservoir and they hadn't opened their outlet in quite a few years. And they were worried about opening it because they thought they might lose the whole reservoir because they couldn't shut it again. And uh, so they decided to use their emergency spillway. And here's how much damage you can see from the pictures running water through that spillway did. Uh, it did a lot of damage and I think they're still repairing it. Um, and then this one, uh, right here close to home in Reno where I live. Uh, it's in between Reno and Carson at Washoe Lake. Uh, it's a high hazard dam and it has, uh, it's a small dam. It's not very high. It's only 12 feet high as you can see and they had a problem out there. 
And they do have, they did have an emergency action plan at the time, but it had not been updated. And we're not sure how many people even had it, you know, plan holders that had it. Uh, and so what happened was, uh, you can see in the picture on the right, or on, on the left, but it's the right downstream toe. Uh, you can see there's a tree there growing right off the edge of this dam. And on the other picture, you can see what the upstream toe looks like. And it's a small dam. And this whirlpool uh, showed up, and a fisherman noticed it. Noticed it when it was small. And uh, he called, I, I believe he called 911 and told them about it. And they sent a fire truck out, and the fire truck couldn't even find the dam, didn't know where it was. And um, it wasn't until he posted something on Facebook, the fisherman, that the park that's over there, the state park, <clears throat> noticed us. And so it was, you know, over 24 hours lost in response to this damn emergency uh, because there was, you know, the emergency action plan was not updated. It had, you know, old contact information in it and, you know, plan holders that should have had it, like the fire department or emergency responders, didn't have it and didn't know where the dam was or, or, uh, or who to call in the, in the case of a dam in or emergency. Um, and so here's some of the damage that happened during that incident. This is that same, this is the upstream uh, tow. This is after they filled in, uh, I think, three, three truckloads of rock, and it was still sucking in the rock underneath the dam. And here's the downstream. You can see that tree. That tree had been cut down, and uh, we, we think the, the roots had... Um, degraded and made a, a flow path for seepage and then uh, that whirlpool had happened and all this uh, material had taken out under the dam. Had this happened to an earthen dam, it would have likely failed before anybody in the emergency response or, or the emer uh, emergency action plan was even noted, notified. Uh, but since this was a uh, you know, concrete and stone masonry dam, it survived um, just barely. And uh, so with that, uh, just moving on to our references, and you guys can look through those. They're, the slides are included. I don't want to hold anybody back too long. And here's the contact information, and if anybody has any questions. And I'll pass the ball over to Hunter. Okay. Thank you, Keith. I really very much appreciate um, everyone sticking around and 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 listening to that end story. Which, I guess, for me, the take home is: Aren't we glad we have fishermen? Um, you know, it it takes a whole community and it takes everybody taking an observation. And I'm really glad that somebody saw something and decided to call. Um, I very much appreciate your presentation, Keith and Danny. Um, do other folks have questions as we kind of round out this portion? This is the end of our webinar, by the way. Um, it is being recorded. I'll give some housekeeping in a minute. But I'd like to open the floor for any questions. People can uh, mute, unmute their own line to ask a question or type something in chat. And I'll encourage everyone to sort of monitor the chat and see. I'm sure this is Tim Burns, but I do have a question. All right, Tim. And introduce yourself, uh, yeah. too. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, this is Tim on the uh, uh, service hydrology, the weather service in Reno. Uh, a great presentation. And I wanted to ask a question for uh, Keith or Danny related to the inundation maps on the EATs. I'm curious about the uh, more specifics of the requirements. I've seen uh, many EATs that may just have a sunny day failure, but I've seen others that have uh, multiple scenarios. Uh, and I wonder if those are in general just extra credit or what are the basic requirements? We usually require just a sunny day because that's usually the worst case. Like you assume it's a full reservoir uh, and the maximum inundation area. Um, obviously, the more you provide, the better it is. Um, but obviously, uh, money is a constraint. So um, it's really just to, to delineate where where a lot of the 
the, the maximum amount of flood water will go. I guess I always think of that as being the PMS uh, with the full reservoir. I mean, it, it does cover a lot of the same stuff, but you're assuming that the reservoir is going to be gone um, and it's just going to wash out downstream. Uh, the PMS can uh, – it, it's not a bad one to have. Uh, it, it, it's not, though, uh, required. Uh, okay. It's really just to be informative and uh, have maximum extent of the inundation area. Okay. Thanks for the clarification. Yeah, of course. Thank you. And, Tim, thank you for being here. Thank you for asking a question, and thank you for using your video. So we can put a face with the name. I'll use mine to lead by example um, and say uh, more, more of these questions, more of these conversations. Does anyone else have any kind of updates, want to just say hello, make a mention of what you learned today, or have a question for Danny or Keith or perhaps Noel? I know that Terry had to leave. Uh, a little early, but um, for anyone's left, this is your chance to ask a question or make a comment. Going once. Going twice. Hi, uh, Hunter, I have uh -huh. a quick question. Great, go ahead. I'd love to post this on our social media. Uh, any? Uh, does anybody have an idea when a video is going to be ready for it? Recorded video. You're talking about uh, Carlos. You're talking about the recording of this presentation. Is that right? Yes, sir. Definitely something that I will connect with you on because I'm the person that's clicking recording. So I got to get it out of my hands and into Aaron's, uh, and then Aaron got to get it to you. But uh, Carlos, maybe you could introduce yourself to anybody who's still here that doesn't know who you are. Yeah, well, really happy to be here. I'm. Uh... Carlos Rendo. I work with the Nevada Division of Water Resources, and I do uh, public outreach management. Awesome. And I am going to use this opportunity then. Oh, and thanks for using your video, Carlos. So we got a face of the name. Uh, can I get you to tell me, Carlos, if you can confirm? Can you see this? Uh, yes. Nevada flood. Nevada Good. Flood. Okay. Great. As we kind of finish out, what I want to do is kind of make a quick mention about what we've done, how we got here, what you can find here at this site that's related to this topic, and that is that back, uh, I think, in August, we had another one of these, and we have the files from that uh, so that it gives you a lot of background that maybe you can share to augment your knowledge if you're a first-time you, you know, attendee here today. Uh, note that that is available to you. Uh, the, the game that I mentioned, of course, during the break, which, you know, is near and dear to my heart and also Carlos, uh, we've been using this scenario or this um, simulation uh, slash video game uh, quite a bit for doing outreach. So there's you can find that there, too. Aaron Warnock, I'm going to call on you to give us maybe some rounding out um, comments or housekeeping items uh, and what to expect next. And then also, Rachel, if you had any uh, uh, any any last additions, you can either speak up or you can chat. Um, but we'll we'll put it on you all to finish out and um, and, and allow folks to take off. I appreciate the folks sticking around a few minutes after our allotted hour two hour webinar. But Aaron, tag, you're it. Thanks, Hunter. Thank you so much, everybody, for attending. Um, as Danny mentioned in his presentation, I was previously um, a member of the dam safety team, and now I'm the state floodplain manager. So it's great to be kind of bringing these two communities together because a dam emergency is a flood. We see different types of floods when we're just dealing with flooding, but in reality, it's another type of flood. So. I'm glad to see these communities coming together, and I hope that you learned a lot and you're not feeling inundated by all this damn EAP information. Uh, in the future, we're going to have some more um, trainings just related to dam safety in Nevada, so keep an eye out for that. We're thinking probably uh, end of May or maybe by June. We will have flyers posted to NevadaFloods.org as soon as we have something planned, and otherwise um, this will go out to uh, the, the attendees today and invite will go out to you guys. So thank you so much. And if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me or any of the contacts um, that we shared today. 
And uh, if you are part of Nevada Silver Jackets, we'll see you uh, about this time next week. So thank you. But if you want to be part of Silver Jackets in Nevada, definitely reach out to Aaron. If you are from a different part of the country, um, let us know uh, how we can help connect you with your Silver Jackets teams. Um, thank you, Aaron, for hosting this and having us be part of it. Uh, Rachel, anything to add as we close out and before I hit yes. stop on the recording? I just wanted to reiterate um, uh, and second, Aaron, thank you to everybody. Thank you to everybody who attended, uh, who helped organize. Wonderful job, Hunter. Excellent presentations, all of the presenters. I had two announcements. If this presentation gave you any ideas for ways that you'd like to have uh, the Silver Jackets team help and support your community, maybe around emergency action um, preparedness or things that you'd like to see covered in future webinars, you know, like, oh, I would really like to hear more about this or that that we just touched on briefly at this presentation, please do reach out. Um, for Silver Jackets future projects, you can reach out either to Aaron or to myself, and I went ahead and put both of our contact information in the chat. I also wanted to go ahead and put a plug in for uh, the upcoming Floodplain Management Association uh, virtual conference. It will be virtual this year, making it easier for everybody to, to attend. Um, the theme this year is Stronger Together, Achieving Continuity in the Face of Recovery uh, in an Equitable and Inclusive Manner. Um, and that's going to be in September, September 7th through 10th. Um, so hope to see some of you there. And that's all for me. Thank you so much for joining us today. Back over to you, Hunter. Okay, recording is stopping now. And thank you all for being here. Um, if you want to get credits, please let us know. I see that there's still a long list of folks. Um, as you leave, just say goodbye through chat and have a great rest of your day. Have a great week, and we'll see you next time. Okay, take care.